want to talk about ourselves. Today we want to share our story. And although it is still a story about barren land, imperialism, and revolt, it is also one about energy. About the future of energy in Egypt, about the lack thereof of energy in Egypt, and sometimes about the misuse of Egypt. So right now, Egypt's population is about 100 million people, and that's a lot of people. In 2050, this number is only expected to rise. By 2050, we're expected to have about 150 million people living in Egypt. With so many mouths to feed, this presents us with an urgent question. Although we value our human capital and our human energy, we find ourselves in a bit of a tricky situation. How are we going to feed these people? How are we going to find the energy to meet the increasing demands? Reports show that by 2030, Cairo is not going to have, Egypt is not going to have sufficient energy, to, sufficient water to sustain itself. So if we can't even imagine ourselves living beyond 2030, how can we begin planning or predicting for a future that is set to take place in 2050? So while the world may be discussing possibilities of energy in 2050, we're still at 2030 figuring out how we're going to make it that far. So with a water crisis on one hand, a population that won't stop growing on the other, we see ourselves heading nowhere but towards the food crisis. How are we going to solve this food crisis? And although this situation may be slightly unique to Egypt and may be somewhat exclusive to the region, we believe that solving this issue is not a national task. We believe that where the world goes, we will go with it. And there are certain trends shaping our world today. Things like the abundance of technology, things like global collaboration, industry 4.0, and things like these trends can shape how our future and how our story with energy is going to play out in the future. And today we're going to present you with two alternative scenarios, both as plausible and as realistic as one another, however each reflects like a different philosophy. Welcome to the Solaris Show. Today we'll be having a very exciting interview with one of our most prominent presidential candidates, Mr. Ahmed Azlem. Can you please welcome him? Thank you, Mr. Azlem, can you please explain to us all Egyptians why should we vote for you? Okay. Well, we know. We know our problems are rising more than any time before. Energy and food subsidies are eating up to twenty billion dollars our GDP annually. Over 26% of our population are below the poverty line. We need change, and we deserve it. So here I am announcing it. Major tax breaks, regulations, and incentives in favor of large corporates. So vote for me, and I promise you, I promise you a better future for every Egyptian. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you explain to us your focus on large corporates, and why... Uh, would entrepreneurship be included in your presidential plan? Of course. Well, entrepreneurs, of course, are of vital importance to our economy. They have innovation, they have the new mindsets, they know how to do things differently. But my opinion, I think we don't need this right now. Solutions are obvious, we just need to realize them. We live in about 8% of our land. If you look here, you can see two intersections with great opportunities. First intersection between the solar belt, one of the sunniest places on Earth, intersecting with the Nubian Reservoir, giving opportunities for extracting groundwater, which opens opportunities in agriculture projects and energy projects. Second intersection between the solar belt and the Red Sea. We can do desalination projects there. This will open opportunities for agriculture and energy projects as well. I promise this will change Egypt. Okay. So we've heard your plan about measure mega projects, but would internal facilitation be the only support mega projects would be getting from you? Of course not. We will be engaging in trade agreements internationally. Why? Because we're entering an era of where data is abundant. Imagine you're a corporate owning a farm or an agriculture project, the neighbor and the neighboring countries around you, you receive from them data indicating that there will be demand increase during the next week. This is an opportunity you will want to realize. So we expect that export activities and trade activities between countries will increase. My job is I will want to make this easier for, for the corporates we have. I promise I will make this better. 
Thank you. I wish you best of luck, and I wish the best of luck to all Egyptians. Thank you. When uh, Singapore gained its, its independence, they started out with two different strategies. The first was to support entrepreneurship in order to alleviate unemployment, and the second was to increase capital investment, which turned Singapore into the third largest oil refinery at the time. At the time, entrepreneurship was a tool for unemployment, but today, entrepreneurship is a tool for so much more. It's a tool for innovation, creativity, progress. Through entrepreneurship, I believe that Egypt can be thrown into the future. We can start competing rather than running to catch up. We invest billions into education, but we see no return or little return. Through entrepreneurship and allowing people to express their ideas, we can see so much more change in Egypt. In fact, the educational uh, emphasis has been going on for 30 years. These new ideas will enable people to be able to innovate in a way that the government can't. The government is barely keeping up with innovation, but it's the people's job to seek them out in order to seek out their own profit. Which means that I'm not actually asking you through my presidency to believe in me, but to believe in the billions of dollars that have been invested into education, to believe in Egyptians and their potential. Thank you. Egypt, as we know, is facing, is facing a food and water crisis. However, the biggest challenge for entrepreneurs is knowledge sharing and know-how. However, the, as we can see in Africa, the know-how is starting to, to evolve. The ability to seek knowledge is starting to evolve. We can see tech hubs and entrepreneurship hubs spring up all around Africa and specifically in Egypt. These hubs will allow for people to learn from each other. So an entrepreneur just starting out can gain the experience of an entrepreneur that has been in the field for 10 years. And in that sense, they can start building on their own ideas. If I don't know how to get past the financing issue, I can seek help from someone who has already done it and secured millions in investment, allowing a raw idea to gain the experience that takes years to behold. And in that sense, we can start diversifying our energy portfolio. If entrepreneurs can start seeking out the research, they can find that photos, through photosynthesis, we are able to actually capture energy from plants. We can start diversifying the energy portfolio, which is a problem that faces the entire MENA region, and start looking to wind farms water turbines, solar panels, and all of the various types of energy uh, capture that is already available in the world, but is a bit unrealistic to expect the government to invest into. And finally, we can imagine a city where all of these energy sources are available. And urban agriculture is a reality. We can start treating buildings as if they are areas of land that are able to produce food. If we can produce the food through our buildings, we can solve both the energy crisis and the food crisis. People can start realizing what they want to consume and how to produce it. Then we see immediate changes, but what is the end goal? Well, if we look at how the energy is uh, produced now, we can see that the energy is mostly produced in the industry sector. However, it's split up between, in consumption terms of course, the industry, commercial, and the transport sector. The future that I envision is a future where the commercial sector are the ones producing the energy, or at least helping produce the energy through the various forms that I've just mentioned. So a house can be powered by solar panels, and through that we can start realizing our own consumption, and start to try to reduce weight in order to minimize our costs. As, of course, it means that the government won't be tasked with the heavy role of providing for all of these people. It becomes the people's responsibility to provide for themselves, while benefiting from the public goods available by, I've made available by the government. And in that sense, we can see a skyscraper, or we can try to imagine a skyscraper, where the energy comes from within, where the water vapor is collected from the air, and there's an area of garden which we obtain food, and we can burn different uh, fuels such as algae and uh, biogas in order to produce energy. We can see that the building in itself is powered by the transparent solar panels, which is the future. In that sense, we can create a sustainable skyscraper. And if we can concentrate that sustainability into just one skyscraper, imagine what we can do with an entire, co uh, with an entire country, which is Egypt. And just as a quick summary, this is Mr. Azem. He's the uh, Azem Adam Smith presidency, if you like. And just as a shorthand, he represents large corporates, mega projects, productive, efficient, data, scattered living, and all those things. This is Mr. Samir, the Elon Musk presidency. And his hope is in entrepreneurs, all right? So if you see the two summaries before you, I'll give you 10 seconds, just have a quick look. And I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand so that I know in this room who would win the election. Okay, you ready? Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Who would vote for Mr. Azem Adam Smith? 
Raise your hands. Okay, a little less than half it looks like. <laughs> and who would vote for Mr. Samir? Mr. Elon Musk. Oh, I see. So, all right. So it looks like Elon Musk pre presidency has the preference of the room. Would you take a step back? I'm going to ask you a second, slightly different question. So this is your preference I've just asked for. The second question is, who do you think is most likely to win? Most likely. Quite apart from your own preference, who is most likely? Who thinks uh, in, the, in 30 years from now, someone like Mr. Azem, the Adam Smith presidency, is likely to win? More, okay, interesting. And then who would think it's more likely? Mr. Samuel Elon Musk. So this is a really telling data point here that our preference and what we think will happen are two quite different pictures. All right, let me just pause here to invite you to ask the, uh, the students your questions or give your comments. And there are two microphones roaming around, so just please raise your hands if you have a comment or a question. Maybe you can just share why you voted the way you did as well. Would anyone like to just ask a question, please? I think that Egypt in the past was the great source for world knowledge from the great library in Alexandria and also the mega structure that related to a lot of innovation. And I'm not talking only about the pyramids, but the future mega cities that you built, which created which was a huge amount of innovation and things outside of the box. What do you think? Egypt needs now to bring back its glory as a source of innovation in the Middle East and in the world? That's a great question. Please, what does Egypt need to bring back its innovation reputation? It's a bit of a difficult question to, to answer, but when you think about innovation, the, the generation that I live in, the people that I've met, they all have different solutions to all the different problems that we face. And in that sense, they all have different ways to implement. However, what, what's really holding us back is the sort of issue of facilitation and how the uh, current status is for entrepreneurs and how, to, how a bit difficult it is to start a business compared to the ideas that exist. So in that sense, I have heard a lot of innovative ideas, but the process of taking a step forward and actually implementing them, that's the, the tricky part. And so, the, perhaps the, the difference is that before the times where the past happened is that the educated people were always the people who had the power to implement, but today with the internet and all the different areas where we can actually gain our knowledge, everyone has different ideas and that's the sense of the hubs. And through that I think it's going to be a bit difficult to adjust to that idea that 100 million people want 100 different, million different solutions, but the kind of process of trial and error I think is going to yield in the future uh, a new way to innovate, and you guys are free to also add on to that. I think the thing on what uh, Elon Musk was saying, um, when you recently in Egypt we've had the more progressive policies, we've had this, we've become more aware of this whole ideology and this whole philosophy, and we've had places to kind of implement that idea. It's just now I feel we're in this situation where we need to work on bridging that gap between where we were, where we want to be and kind of learning how to use, utilize all the different resources and all the different opportunities that exist to kind of bridge that gap efficiently and effectively. And yeah, I also think that government support is a huge part of it, and this is why we based our scenario on presidential elections, because we really do believe that what the government decides on policies, excuse me. Use the mic. He's eating the policies helping entrepreneurs or large corporates to actually implement their ideas is what we need in the country. Thank you. Let's take another comment or question. Yeah, please. Yes, over there, please. Yeah. Good morning, I'm Serena, I'm from Shell. First and foremost, uh, well done, I'm very impressed. I like the idea of uh, buildings are able to look after themselves and the sense of creativity plus productivity. So my question here would be, what drives creativity? That's a big question. What drives creativity? Uh, so uh, recently, I had, maybe a year ago, we had a training on innovation by the uh, innovation leader at PayPal, and in that sense, it kind of changed the way that I personally perceive creativity. 
And I think that that applies to the entire country in the sense that creativity and innovation is a tool, or, or is uh, expressed from a tool of understanding the people. So that the more that we understand the issues that people face, we can start to get creative in the terms of how we solve them. And the, to kind of relate that to what we were talking about is, is that the entrepreneurship sense is that you are creative because you have you perceive your issues in a different way. So through the hubs or through the, the connections of entrepreneurs, people can build on these small, creative, innovative ways of solving their very specific problems, come up with a creative solution that's, that caters to more than just one person. So, so maybe this is a bit of a personal opinion, but this is how I see creativity to be fostered, as well as an educational system that fosters critical thinking. So if an educational system kind of focuses on just learning the, the knowledge that's around the world, it doesn't really benefit creativity. But if I learn how to think rather than what to think, I think that also plays a big part in terms of my creative process. I think uh, creativity will increase in the future uh, and will be driven mainly by connectivity. You will be having much more lines connected to the internet so that ideas will be shared among the whole community over the internet. So when you have a whole lot more of ideas, maybe a combination of two ideas will bring up a new idea. So the connectivity we expect in the future we will bring creativity in a, to a whole new level. Um, I also think that facing our problems. In Egypt, you have a lot of survival problems, and being stuck in that position would force us Egyptians to think outside of the box. Um, that's what. That, this is why we developing countries do have an, a higher yeah, expectation or higher potential to actually create. Necessity is the mother of invention, as, it, as the saying goes. Maybe one final question. Is there anyone who'd like that? Two questions. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, good morning. Good My morning. name is Naeem. I am from Toyota Motors. So actually, the uh, very much appreciated about your future vision. It's very, very much appreciated. So firstly, I had voted for Elon Musk because he's a free. But then I voted that who is more likely to win is Adam Smith. Because their solutions are more immediate and more visible based on ground reality. Elon Musk is too much futuristic. So the best ideal situation is that there should be a combination. And second, my question that is that when we talk about the moving forward, we have to move all population around the world. So there's a big gap, both in educational level, both in social justice, and both economic economically. So if the most majority of the people, especially talking about Egypt, there is an unemployment ratio, like literacy rate. So how your ideas or how your energy solutions can motivate and can bring the other population who doesn't buy these ideas to bring along on your ideas so that you can go forward? Because the reason if Elon Musk is giving some ideas, majority of people will still go with Adam Smith because there's an immediate solution. So how do you think that these kind of things can be closer the gap? Um. I think the reason that people would be more likely to vote to someone uh, for someone like Adam Smith is a, sim a simple question of access. So for example, in Egypt you have a population of 100 million people, but only 5% of these people have access to a network like Facebook. So with increased access to technology, with increased access to different ideas, people become more and more open to them. People find them not that once they understand these ideas and once they learn to work with them, they're less afraid of them and more likely to kind of be okay with taking a risk with someone like Elon Musk just because they now have a better understanding of how these ideas work and how they operate elsewhere in the world. So I think personally, and I would say that it's just a matter of the type of access to information people have and with the increase of that access um, to the population, it's going to be easier to mobilize a larger group of people to kind of believe in someone like Elon Musk. Uh, that um, it's a matter of economic feasibility. And I think we don't need to do anything about it. It will realize itself without any intervention. I mean that the substitutes of the ideas of Elon Musk are now much more expensive than the ideas that are traditional. By time, the substitute will become much cheaper, and the traditional uh, sources of energy will become more expensive, so change will enforce itself. 
So the, your need to convince people of their new ideas will it will be a much easier job to convince people because it will be much more economically feasible by then. Just a interesting comment at the end is that um, in terms of market regulations, uh, we already see that a lot of the startups that are coming up don't have a lot of access to talent, and in that sense, because uh, like it's sort of leader in capitalism, we can see that since labor is sort of an asset to our company, people want to develop that asset in order to be able to to. to function better in the company itself. So from a pure, pure, purely profit-seeking uh, perspective, more and more companies are now uh, assembling trainings or acquiring even educational facilities that will help bridge that gap between the people who don't have uh, better access to education and the people who want to, to, to work efficiently. So maybe it's a bit idealistic to think that, but some of the startups already exist. So some of the NGOs and actually uh, uh, for-profit organization are seeking to educate people in order to integrate them into the uh, working community. Final comment from the group? Wonderful. Can we give them another warm round of applause? Thank you for the great questions and for the very thoughtful answers. I'm really impressed. Wonderful. We want to give you, uh, as a group, an opportunity just to reflect a little more on the scenarios and the implications. The group can just sort of move to the side, if that's all right. And uh, time is tight, so I'm going to ask you to get into very small groups of three and no more than four, so three or four. And the two questions, and they're up there as well, we want you to think about, uh, would you just pick one scenario? We don't have time to consider both, and it's hard to live in two different worlds. Just pick one of the two scenarios, either the Adam Smith or the Elon Musk, and ask yourself, if this were the world that we are living in in the future, what product or service or maybe model or idea would be irrelevant. It's useless, it's pointless in that future. And what product, service, idea, model would thrive, would grow, would have a future, would sunrise in that particular future, okay? So I'll give you a moment to think about that. And we'll get you into small groups of three or four and just have a quick conversation sharing your thoughts. Product, service, idea that will be irrelevant, product, service, idea that will thrive.